Donald Trump sparks more controversy over Vladimir Putin and America's generals. Why one analyst believes there's media bias. Beyond genocide, we ask lawmakers what they will do to protect Christians in the Middle East. Ecumenical service. The Pope's personal representative to the U.S. joins other religious groups to pray for peace. And personal reflections in a new book. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI talks about his sudden retirement and his successor on EWTN News Nightly for September 8, 2016. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Donald Trump faces criticism tonight for his comments about the U.S. military and Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Republican nominee spoke during a national security forum broadcast last night on NBC. Under the leadership of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, the generals have been reduced to rubble. They have been reduced to a point where it's embarrassing for our country. Trump said the U.S. should work with Russia to fight ISIS, and he praised Putin for his strong leadership. If he says great things about me, I'm going to say great things about him. I've already said he is really very much of a leader. I mean, you can say, oh, isn't that a terrible thing? He called I mean, the man has very strong control over a country. Now, it's a very different system, and I don't happen to like the system. But certainly in that system, he's been a leader. Trump's opponent was quick to jump on his comments. In a press conference this morning, Hillary Clinton said Trump failed a key test of being commander-in-chief. Even taking the astonishing step of suggesting that he prefers the Russian president to our American president. Now, that is not just unpatriotic and insulting to the people of our country, as well as to our commander-in-chief, it is scary. President Obama also knocks Trump from halfway around the world in Laos. He panned the Republican leader, saying di diplomacy is serious business and Trump's ideas are outright wacky. I don't think the guy's qualified to be president of the United States. And every time he speaks, that uh, opinion is confirmed. In Cleveland, Trump changed the focus today to school choice. He said the U.S. should shift $20 billion to a school choice block grant that would help 11 million students living in poverty. That means that we want every disadvantaged child to be able to choose the local public, private, or charter school, a magnet school, any of these schools that is best for them and for their family. Trump says each state will develop its own formula, but the dollars must follow the student instead of supporting established schools. Trump also proposes merit pay to reward good teachers. And Trump faces criticism from former supporters, including a frequent News Nightly guest who is upset with Trump's comments about immigration. Alfonso Aguilar is executive director of the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. When we last talked at the Republican convention in Cleveland, you supported Donald Trump. Now you say you were disappointed and misled by the Republican candidate's immigration stance. And I read your op-ed in La Opinion, and you say his stance is draconian and that neither Trump nor Clinton are alternatives for Latinos. So what's a Hispanic to do? It's a very tough decision, especially for uh, Latino Catholics, Latinos of faith, who to choose. Uh, the perception is that there's a candidate that's offensive to Latinos, offends Latinos, has policy proposals on immigration that are not good policy, that criminalize undocumented immigrants. And then we have a candidate, Hillary Clinton, who uses immigration for political gain to try to get the Latino vote, but that on issues that we care about, like the dignity of the human person, the right to life, she's terrible. She believes in an, okay, an abortion again. demand. But what to do? In the polling place, what do you do? Well, first of all, we have to come out and vote. That's part of our responsibility as citizens. It's our duty to come out and vote. But we don't have to vote for a specific candidate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come out to vote. I'm going to go out to vote, vote down the ballot for good conservative candidates, and then leave the presidential ballot blank. I'm not going to vote for Hillary Clinton, but I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump. All right. Well, let's, let's go forward and, and talk about how Republicans should be reaching out to Hispanics. So according to a Pew Research, Research Center poll in July, 77 percent 
of registered Hispanic Catholic voters say they would vote for or lean toward Clinton compared to 16 percent who are voting for Trump. Clinton has a 66 to 24 percent advantage over Trump among Hispanic registered voters. Now, the numbers of Hispanic voters that we have and the Catholics all are saying one thing, despite those yeah. pro-life issues, despite things that are important to their faith, they are going to Hillary Clinton. And it's because of immigration and the tone that Republican candidates use. It doesn't mean that immigration is the most important issue, but it's a gateway issue. It's, a, it's an issue that is important to the community. And if you're not constructive on the issue, it doesn't matter how good you are on other issues, on the economy and school vouchers. Donald Trump was talking today about school vouchers. The majority of Hispanics support school vouchers, but they're not going to listen to you if you don't get that issue right. It doesn't mean that a Republican candidate has to embrace Obama's amnesty, but they have to be constructive. They have to show that they can open themselves to a form of legalization. Very and that's what Trump was leaning towards. He thought, we, we thought really that he but was going to do that, end, but then at the end, he, it didn't he happen. doubled down on his rhetoric again. Alfonso Aguilar, thank you so much. Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Vice President Joe Biden criticizes Republicans for failing to pass a Zika funding bill. The virus can cause life-threatening birth defects in unborn children. Republicans haven't passed it, saying they don't want some of the health care money to be designated for Planned Parenthood. If you care about children, and that's the argument that a lot of our conservative friends are making about uh, dealing with uh, Planned Parenthood, if you care about them, wake up, man. An awful lot of people, an awful lot of babies, an awful lot of children being carried in the womb are going to end up in a very, very, very lifelong, serious situation. Biden spoke during a press conference with other Democratic leaders on Capitol Hill. They also criticized Republicans for failing to vote on President Obama's Supreme Court nominee and for gun control bills. Pro-life advocates reject Biden's claims about unborn children, saying every child has value. Speaker Paul Ryan says in July, the Republican-controlled Congress passed a bill to make sure Zika funding goes where it is needed most. But the bill was blocked. Yeah, the Senate Democrats voted not once. Not twice, but three times. The Senate Democrats voted three times to block this. They need to get past the politics and work, work with us to protect the public. Congressmen lay out ways to defend besieged Christians in the Middle East. The U.S. State Department said ISIS committed genocide against Christians and other religious minorities. That was in March. But what comes now? Capitol Hill reporter Jason Calvi joins us with that answer. Jason. Lauren, several new bills to answer that question. Representative Chris Smith in New Jersey introducing one today that would make it easier for the victims of genocide to come to the United States. They wouldn't need what's usual, a recommendation or a referral from the UN or a non-government organization. This is just one of the issues that lawmakers brought up today in a in gathering of the In Defense of Christians National Convention taking place right here in Washington, D.C. And we asked some of the lawmakers what they can do right now to protect persecuted Christians. If we go and take out ISIS, what fills that vacuum? What government is put in place? How do we structure that? And then how do we create these safe areas using military to protect Christians protect other minority groups. That has to be a part of the conversation. Using the U.S. military to protect those Christians? Of course, yeah, it has to, they have to be part of the coalition. We need far more bombing raids, and we need rules of engagement that say if you see a tanker truck carrying ISIS oil, you bomb it. Our current rules of engagement, as of the last time I was briefed, is that um, if you think the driver might be a civilian, you don't bomb it. That is absurd. Those are not the rules we had during World War II. Trying to figure out a way to maybe provide a special lane to help get Christians and Jews out of the Middle East. Also trying to figure out what's going to, what the Middle East will look like after ISIS is defeated. Will the Christians, Jews, other religious minorities be allowed to return to their homes? How will that be funded? And that question is all the more pressing tonight. The head of the Defense Intelligence Agency saying that the battle for Iraq's second largest city, Mosul, is about two to three months away. Uh, uh, the ISIS right now claims that city. It is the former home of many Christians who ISIS kicked out. Lauren?
Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. People from all walks of faith gathered last night to pray for an end to the genocide of Middle Eastern Christians. That includes Pope Francis's U.S. representative here in the U.S., who called for Christian unity. Wyatt Goolsby reports. Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Assyrian, Armenian. Christian leaders gathered in our nation's capital in a solemn ecumenical prayer service last night, each clergy member carrying a candle representing the men, women, and children who have died at the hands of ISIS. With his grace, amen. Archbishop Christophe Pierre led the service in one of his first public celebrations since being appointed in April as the Pope's U.S. representative. He says coming together in prayer is critical. Prayer helps us to, to live a kind of conversion and to look at the other as a brother instead of an enemy. In a sign of unity, prayers were offered in multiple languages, like Greek and Arabic. The violence in the Middle East hits home for Armenian Apostolic Archbishop Oshagan Choloyan, who was born in Aleppo, Syria. He compares the current violence to the Armenian genocide of the early 20th century. We survived. We survived because we believed in ever-living Lord. And God lives, we live. In honor of today's feast of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary, religious leaders called for the Blessed Mother's intercession. Canon Alistair MacDonald Radcliffe, an Anglican priest, has worked for years on interfaith dialogue. Gatherings like this are important, but they also reflect, I think, continuing difficulties because of our commitment to truth, things that we each want to maintain. But he says this is a step in the right direction. Archbishop Pierre agrees. We yeah. know that the problems are, there are many. The solutions come from, uh, from, the, the, from the dialogue, you know, from the dialogue between uh, persons, between communities. And it's that dialogue, inspired by Christ, that gives him hope. In Washington, Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, Pope Francis explains how small gestures can promote peace. See his return to his daily Santa Marta Mass. And Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI describes the moment Francis took over and his own struggles as head of the church. Today we celebrate the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary, exactly nine months after her Immaculate Conception. St. Augustine describes the Blessed Virgin's birth as an event of cosmic and historic significance. Happy birthday to our Holy Mother. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Pope Francis resumes his daily Santa Marta Mass for the first time since taking a summer break. The Pope used his homily to encourage people to promote peace in their daily lives. The Holy Father says small gestures can make a global difference. A new book about Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI comes out tomorrow. It's called The Last Conversations and some excerpts have already been released. Alan Holdren is Rome Bureau Chief of EWTN's Catholic News Agency. What does Pope Benedict say about the reason he stepped down? Well, Lauren, he says that it wasn't because he was trying to escape something, it wasn't because he was feeling pressured, he said it wasn't because he was blackmailed, and if he had felt that, he said he wouldn't have stepped down. He said that it wasn't also a, a result of disappointment. It was because he felt like he'd overcome major difficulties. He was in a moment of peace and in good conscience. He said it was, uh, it was time to step down, to pass along the steering wheel, he said. Does he have any shortcomings that he addressed? How does he characterize his papacy? Yeah, this is really incredible to hear a, a former pope reflect on his own papacy. And he says that he did uh, experience weakness. He said he's not a practical governor. Uh, perhaps he was a little irresolute. Or he, was having, he had trouble making big decisions. But he said that, uh, that that's not his character, that he's more of a professor, that uh, he tends to look at things in a more spiritual way and uh, perhaps to meditate on, on questions more than to make those, those major decisions. He said that Pope Francis is more of a practical decision maker in that sense. Uh, he did say that he doesn't feel that he's a failure. He said that he gave eight years of good service to the church. And uh, despite there being difficult moments, that really he, he said that he saw people come to the church in a new way during his papacy, and also that there was a very positive movement, he said, uh, during his time as pope. 
what does Benedict say about handing off the baton and the election of Pope Francis? Well, he did say that, uh, that he was glued to his television set when the Pope was elected, when Pope Francis was elected. Uh, he didn't actually receive a telephone call that was made to him by the newly elected Pope before he came out on the ba balcony of St. Peter's Basilica. He said later when he heard of that, he was very touched by it. He said he was uncertain what to think also when he heard the name of the new Pope. He said he knew who Cardinal Bergoglio was. Uh, he, was he was a little bit uncertain, though, about uh, how things would go. But then he saw him on the balcony. He saw his relationship with God. He was touched by the prayer that, uh, that Pope Francis asked for him as his predecessor. And then he also saw Pope Francis' relationship with the people, and he was convinced. He says he's absolutely content and happy that Pope Francis is Pope. Alan Holdren, Catholic News Agency. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Lauren. Pope Francis welcomes members of an interreligious symposium to, to the Vatican to talk about the environment. The Institute for Interreligious Dialogue of Argentina is organizing the event centered around our common home. Vatican Radio says the two-day gathering is the first of its kind for these organizations involved, and it's focused on the Holy Father's encyclical about the environment. Pope Francis also greets Benedictines at their Congress for Abbots and Abbesses. He described their monasteries as an oasis of spirituality and praised the Benedictines for being people of mercy, a tie to this Jubilee Year of Mercy. When reporting on politics, journalists are often blamed for being biased. It happened last night with NBC's Matt Lauer, who conducted back-to-back -back interviews of the presidential candidates. Both sides attacked him for being soft and harsh. I talked earlier this week with The Hill's editor-in-chief, Bob Cusack, about the role of media bias in this election. I want to talk to you about media bias mm -hmm. in this election. Are we seeing, as we typically do, journalists vying for Hillary Clinton simply because they are Democrats? Is, is that your take? Well, most, most political journalists are Democrats, and that doesn't mean that, that they're all biased. They certainly aren't. There's some great journalists, and of course you have an exercise as a journalist to vote or not vote. Um, but what we're seeing, I think, in this election cycle is that the media is being more favorable to Hillary Clinton than they've ever been before. Now, when Obama faced Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton's staff was, was borderline abusive to reporters in 2008. And so the Clinton staff was accusing the media, well, you're, you're rooting for Obama. Um, well, I did think they favored Obama, not to say Obama's people were, oh, sure. were, were flowery or anything like that. But this, Hillary Clinton's not used to this, where most of the press, and we've seen some major press figures this time around, start to side with more with Hillary Clinton than, than Donald Trump. So I do think that it's an interesting thing to watch, the media coverage between now and Election Day, word choices both in print as well uh, as on television. Well, let's take yesterday's Washington Post front page, mm -hmm. which uh, we talked about on the show. And it, it was a win for Hillary Clinton because they did a 50-state poll. Hillary Clinton has many more electoral votes. And so it really looked like, hey, here's this poll. Hillary Clinton's great. Yeah. What about Donald Trump? Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and it does raise the question of if the situation were reversed, do they make a big deal out of it? So I also don't think, however, it's, it's smart for Republicans, i.e. Donald Trump, to complain about the media. Ronald Reagan got elected twice, uh, and George W. Bush got elected twice, and his father got elected, even though most political journalists back then were Democrats. So it's something you can overcome, um, but I do think it is a fascinating thing to watch because in green rooms in up the East Coast that I've been in, Washington, you know, a lot of the media figures are not fans of Donald Trump. Well, and I think that is the sentiment across the country that Donald Trump is not favored, and it is his. And we recently saw that he uh, is saying he is not going to have Politico and BuzzFeed on his blacklist anymore. Right. His strategy before was to say these media organizations are banned and mm -hmm. we're not going to talk to them. And I, why do you think he's changing his tune now? I, I don't think it helps him. I, and I still think he can use it to his advantage. The media is never popular and we're not popular <laughs> right. now. So we're just, not even as popular as lawyers. Right, right? exactly. We're like so, below that. So he can run against us and say, listen, the media is out to get me. That's good. But I think banning reporters is something that should not be done. I think it's a smart move to kind of soften his image. He needs to soften his image. That is key. Okay, Bob Cusack, Editor-in-Chief of The Hill, thank you so much. Thanks, Lauren. Up next, Olympic controversy. One swimmer gets slapped with a lengthy band. And the beauty of faith, how our mother Mary is portrayed in art.
Dr. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith, joins us as we celebrate the Nativity of the Virgin Mary. Jem, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Well, what are we talking about today? It's an 18th century piece and on the birth of our Holy Mother, fittingly enough. That's right. This sketch in pen and ink from the National Gallery of Art is a beautiful image to reflect on as the church celebrates the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Anne has just given birth to Mary and St. Joachim, her father, uh, is, is kneeling in thanksgiving. They're surrounded by a cloud of angels and uh, they, as the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit is descending on the scene in the form of a dove. And it's pencil, did you say? That's right. Pencil. Pen and ink. Pen and ink. And it is so um, celestial, isn't it? That's right. It's the clouds, the heavens opened up. And really what's going on here is we are being reminded that God preserved Mary from the stain of original sin in her Immaculate Conception. So at her birth, she's filled with the Holy Spirit. Hence the celestial aura of everything. All right. The next piece you have also, same theme, right, by Andrea Di Bartolo but it's much more colorful. I like this one. That's right. This is filled with color and it's also a very simple, ordinary setting of a home, a room. And what we're seeing here is basically this panel was a part of a much larger altarpiece, a series of paintings uh, on the uh, life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. On the right, we see St. Anne. She is reclining on a bed behind a parted red curtain and she is washing and purifying her hands. And St. Joe Kim is now waiting outside in expectation. <laughs> I love that. That's right. Right, he's outside the room, get out. That's right. <laughs> and, and he is waiting patiently, but really the newborn baby, Mary, is at the center of the composition. She's being held by two women um, in the foreground. And then there's the woman with a platter of food uh, at the doorway, uh, looking straight out at us, the viewer. She is inviting us to join in this celebration of the birth of the Virgin Mary. Thank you so much for doing this. And we're so excited that you have a new show launching on EWTN. Tell us about that. That's right. This will be a documentary called The Beauty of Faith, same, uh, named after these segments that we've been doing here. Um, and really it is to reflect on the place of beauty and the arts in the new evangelization, in preaching, in teaching, in the home. Uh, and so we have a number of uh, wonderful guests who will be reflecting on the beauty of faith in the new evangelization. It's just a great idea and a great program. You're the perfect person to do it. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you, Lauren. And you can see more of her work and, um, and information about her upcoming program at EWTN.com. Olympic swimmer Ryan Lochte forfeits $100,000 and a chance to swim at next year's World Championships. The swimming ban is a part of a penalty for reportedly lying about being robbed at a gas station in Brazil during the Summer Olympics. The case first brought embarrassment to Brazil, then to Lochte when surveillance video showed the robbery never happened. And we're getting a closer view of the destruction in Italy following last month's earthquake. Firefighters are using aerial drones and ground-based robots to survey the damage. They're trying to create detailed models of damaged buildings and artwork in places like the 15th century Church of Sant'Agostino. Pilgrims in Rome can venerate the relics of St. Teresa of Calcutta. Her room at Rome's Missionaries of Charity House was opened today. The church teaches Relics are physical remains of a saint or objects that touched a saint's body. Before Mother Teresa's canonization, hundreds of pilgrims venerated her relics in an Italian church. The shrine contained some blood from the Albanian nun who, as we all know, inspired millions of people around the world. That does it for us this evening. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Lauren Ashburn. Thanks for watching. Good night and God bless.